Go is a really popular language at the moment, and for good reason. It's a really great language to learn. I'm going to give you an overview of the language, and by the end of the video, you'll hopefully have the skills that you need to write simple Go programs. If you go to golang.org, you'll find a link to be able to download and install Go. If you're on a Mac, you can use brew install Go if you find that easier. Once you've done that, you'll have the Go command line tools available. When it comes to creating a Go project, you might find it a little different to what you're used to in other languages. The idea in Go is that all of your projects live in the same place, and this place is called your workspace. By default, this is a folder called Go in your home directory, and you can see this if you type Go env Go path. So I'm going to actually create this folder. This is our workspace. Inside here we need another folder called src. And this is where all of our source code is going to go. So now inside of SRC, you can create a folder for each of your projects. Let's make our first Go file. You'll often see them being called main.go, but it can actually be called anything. The first line in a Go file needs to be the name of the package. Every project, at least if you want to be able to execute it, needs to have a package called main. The next section is the imports. This is where you can import different packages. There are loads of useful packages in the standard library. A common one is FMT, which has functions related to input and output. So open brackets, and then you can list out all of the packages that you want to import. Note there are no commas in this list. We'll just use FMT for now. Next, let's look at functions. You use the func keyword followed by the name of the function, and the first one you'll want is a function called main. It takes no arguments and it doesn't return anything. But this is where the program starts, a function called main inside of the package called main. This will output hello world to the terminal. To run this, you can use go run followed by the name of the file. If you want to compile the code into an executable, then you can use go build in the program's directory. So this time, it doesn't run our code, there's no output here in the terminal, but what it has created is this binary file here. This is an executable, in Windows it's going to be a .exe file, and we can run that in the terminal. Alternatively, you can use go install. This is going to do something very similar, except the executable is put in this bin folder. It sits in our workspace next to the source folder. And if this program had external dependencies, so if we'd imported something from outside of the standard library, it would compile and cache those dependencies into a package folder. Let's go back to our Go file and look at variables. To declare a variable, you use the var keyword followed by the name of the variable and then the type. So I'll make an int, I can output this. If we don't provide an initial value, then the zero value for the type will be used. Every type has a zero value. For integers, the zero value is literally just zero. For strings, for example, the zero value is the empty string. I could later assign something to this variable, or I could do it at the same time as declaring it. So I could do this again, and then add the two integers together. So we get 12. When we give variables an initial value like we're doing here, there's a shorthand syntax that we can use. Drop the var add a colon and an equals, and then the value. And we can omit the type because Go can infer it. So this is the same as what we had before. If I do this to all of them, you can see we get the same results, but this is a bit neater to read. Go has if statements. They allow you to execute a block of code if a condition is true. Note that there are no brackets around the condition. There's also else if and else. Let's look at arrays. An array holds multiple elements of the same type, but the number of elements that an array holds is fixed. It has a specific length. For example, we could create an array that holds five ints. If we output this, we can see that it does hold five ints. All of the elements will be initialized with their types zero value. Again, in the case of ints, this is the number zero. We can use square brackets to index the array, so we could set element to position two to be seven. Arrays are zero index, so the, the first element is at position zero. If you want to be able to initialize the contents of an array more easily, we can use the shorthand syntax again. So drop the var, use a colon and an equals, and at the end of the line, open curly brackets, and then you can list out your values here. Now you might be thinking, arrays with a fixed length sound inconvenient. Well, they are. If I wanted to add a sixth element to this array, I can't, because the length of the array is part of the array's type. To overcome this, you can use slices. 
Slices are an abstraction over the top of arrays to make them easier to work with. Namely, they don't have a fixed number of elements. So if we wanted to create a slice of ints instead of an array of ints, we simply remove the element count and leave an empty set of square brackets. So now this is a slice of ints. So why is this useful? Well, now we can use the built-in append function to add something new to the end of the slice. Append doesn't modify the original slice, it returns a new one. Slices are backed by arrays, so here Go will be creating a new array in the background and copying stuff across, but when you use slices, you don't have to worry about it. It all happens behind the scenes. Maps are really useful. They hold key value pairs. They're like um, dictionaries in Python or associative arrays in PHP. The type definition for a map is the word map, and in square brackets, the type of the keys, followed by the type of the values in the map. And to create a map, you use the built-in make function and give it this type. We can set key value pairs using square brackets. It's similar to indexing arrays. You can use the same syntax to get the value for a particular key. And you can use the delete function to remove something from the map. So square is now gone. Next, loops. The only type of loop in Go is the for loop. We declare and initialize a variable using the shorthand syntax we saw a couple of minutes ago. This is the counter. Then we set the stopping condition, so loop while i is less than 5, for example. And then after another semicolon, you can increment the counter or decrement it or do whatever you want at the end of each iteration. So this is going to go through the loop five times and print out the number, uh, the value of i uh, in each iteration. So it starts at 0, and it goes up to 4, and as soon as it gets to 5, it's not less than 5 anymore, so it stops iterating. The for loop also doubles as a while loop, so if you delete the variable declaration from the beginning and the increment at the end, you've got a while loop. So this will do the same as before. Another thing you can do with the loop is iterate over each element in an array or a slice by using range. We get the index and the value out of doing range of an array. Printline has a feature where you can pass multiple arguments to it and it'll output all of them separated by spaces. You can do the same thing with a map. But you'll get the key instead of the index. So far we've had everything in the main function, but we could easily create a new function. If you want to accept arguments, you just need to give them a name and a type. And if you want to return value, then you need to give the type of that after the, the brackets. So this is going to take two ints and return a different int. So we could do something really simple like this, and then call it up here. In Go, functions can have multiple return values. So if I made a, a square root function, which takes a float64, it can return another float64, and it can also return an error. These are all built-in types. Since the square roots of negative numbers are complex numbers, we could limit this function to positive inputs only returning an error if x is less than 0. So we want to return two values. The first one is the float64. We're not doing the calculation, so I'll just return 0. And then we can use the new function in the errors package if I import that to create an error. Otherwise we can do the square root, there's actually a square root function in the math package, so I'll just defer to that. We still need to return two values though, and in this situation we don't want to return an error, so I'll just return nil instead of an error. So now when we call our square root function, we get two values, we get the result and we get an error. If the error is not nil, then that means something went wrong, so let's just output that. Otherwise, output the result. So it does the square root of a positive number. If we were to make this negative, then it's going to return an error, and we'll get uh, this line executing instead. So that's how functions with multiple return values work. It's really useful to be able to return errors like this, because Go doesn't have exceptions if you're used to working with those in other languages. 
A struct is a collection of fields, so you can group things together to create a more logical type. To create a struct type, you want to do this outside of a function. Uh, use the word type followed by the name, so this can be anything you want, and then the word struct. Inside curly brackets, you can list out the fields that you want the struct to have. Each field needs to have a name and a type. So I'm going to make this one a, a string, and I'm going to make this one an int. It could be anything. It could be another struct. So that's the type. To create a struct of that type, you want to use the name of it. And then just like when you initialize an array or a slice, you can use curly brackets to set the fields. So first I'd set the, the field called name, I use a colon, and then the value. And if I output this, you will see it's created a struct. If you want to get a specific field out of the struct, then you can use dot notation to do that. So this time, it'll just output 23. The last thing I want to talk about is pointers. If I have a, a variable, as we've seen, it's really easy to output that. But we can also get the memory address of the variable by using an ampersand. So this gives us a pointer to i. Now if I had a function which incremented a variable, and we called it like this, this is going to be useless and not actually do anything because i is copied by value, so the increment function gets a copy of i. It increments that, but then since we're not returning anything, that copy is just discarded and the original variable is not modified. If, however, we pass a pointer to the variable, then the function is going to be able to look at the value at that memory reference and modify the original version. So we can accept a pointer by prefixing the type with an asterisk. We can send the pointer by using ampersand. And what we need to do here is dereference the pointer. So we use another asterisk here. Without that, this is going to be incrementing the memory address, but that's useless. We want to see what's at that memory address using the asterisk, dereference it, and then increment that value. So now this actually does modify the original i variable. Very quick introduction to pointers. I've glossed over a lot of details here. If you're unfamiliar with pointers, it's definitely worth taking the time to read up on them properly. But I hope this has been a good introduction to the language. We've learned about functions, variables, if statements, arrays, slices, maps, loops, errors, and pointers. It should be enough to get started. Leave a comment if you do have any questions. If you're interested in a career in software development, or you just want to improve your skills, then you might find it useful to dive further into computer science. There's a lot more to computer science than programming. It's a very broad field that covers mathematical topics like linear algebra, probability, it covers hardware, algorithms, and having an understanding of these topics can often greatly simplify a coding project. Brilliant.org is a great place to learn more about computer science. They offer curated courses on many things from the fundamentals all the way to cutting edge stuff like artificial neural networks. The guided courses go into great detail to build up your knowledge and then walk you through problems to help you practice and really understand what you're learning. Understanding how memory works, for example, is going to help you write more efficient code and it'll help you reason about the code because you'll understand what's happening at the operating system and the CPU level. If this sounds interesting, go to brilliant.org slash jakewright, the link is in the description. You can sign up for free, but the first 200 people who go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. If you found this video useful, click the like button, hit subscribe if you want to see more tutorials like this one, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.